Chapter Six of Stories by Foreign Authors, Spanish Authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Aruso. The Moorish couple must have slept soundly and sweetly among the thickets on the roadside that night, for it was fully nine o'clock on the following morning when they reached the foot of Cape Negro. At that place there is a village of Arab shepherds and husbandmen called Medik, consisting of a few huts, a Morabito or Mohammedan hermitage, and a well of fresh water, with its curbstone and its copper bucket, like the wells we see represented in certain biblical scenes. At this hour the village was completely deserted, its inhabitants having betaken themselves, with their cattle and their implements of labour, to the neighbouring hills and glens. "'Wait for me here,' said Manos Gordas to his wife. "'I am going in quest of Ben Munuza, who at this hour is probably ploughing his field on the other side of yonder hill.' "'Ben Munuza!' exclaimed Zama, with a look of terror. "'The renegade of whom you spoke to me?' make your mind easy returned manos gordas i have the upper hand now in a few hours i shall be back and you will see him following me like a dog this is his cabin wait for us inside and make us a good mess of alcazus with the maize and the butter you will find at hand you know i like it well cooked ah i forgot if i should not be back before nightfall ascend the hill cross over to the other side and if you do not find me there or if you should find my dead body return to ceuta and post this letter another thing if you should find me dead search my clothing for this parchment if you do not find it upon me you will know that ben munuza has robbed me of it in which case proceed from ceuta to tetuan and denounce him as a thief and an assassin to the authorities that is all i have to tell you farewell the moorish woman wept bitterly as manos gordas took the path that led to the summit of the neighbouring hill on reaching the other side of the hill manos gordas descried in a glen a short distance off a corpulent moor dressed in white ploughing the black earth with the help of a fine yoke of oxen in patriarchal fashion this man who seemed a statue of peace carved in marble was the morose and dreaded renegade ben munuza the details of whose story would make the reader shudder with horror if we were to hear them suffice it for the present to say that he was some forty years old that he was active vigorous and robust and that he was of a gloomy cast of countenance although his eyes were blue as the sky and his beard yellow as the african sunlight which had bronzed his originally fair complexion good morning manos gordas cried the renegade as soon as he perceived the moor and his voice expressed the melancholy pleasure the exile feels in a foreign land when he meets some one with whom he can converse in his native tongue good morning juan falgueira responded ben carime in ironical accents as he heard this name the renegade trembled from head to foot and seizing the iron bar of the plough prepared to defend himself what name is that you have just pronounced he said advancing threateningly toward manos gordas the latter awaited his approach laughing and answered in arabic with a courage which no one would have supposed him to possess i have pronounced your real name the name you bore in spain when you were a christian and which i learned when i was in oran three years ago in oran yes in oran what is there extraordinary in that you had come from oran to morocco i went to oran to buy hands i inquired there concerning your history describing your appearance and some spaniards living there related it to me i learned that you were a galician and your name was juan falgueira and that you had escaped from the prison of granada on the eve of that day appointed for your execution for having robbed and murdered fifteen years ago a party of gentlemen whom you were serving in the capacity of, of muleteer do you still doubt that i know who you are tell me my soul responded the renegade in a hollow voice looking cautiously around have you related this story to any of the moors does any one but yourself in this accursed land know it because the fact is i want to live in peace without having any one or anything to remind me of that fatal deed which i have well expiated i am a poor man i have neither family nor country nor language nor even the god who made me left to me 
I live among enemies, with no other wealth than these oxen and these fields, bought by fruit of ten years' sweat and toil. Consequently, you do very wrong to come and tell me. Hold! cried Manos Gordas, greatly alarmed. Don't cast those wolfish glances at me, for I come to do you a great service, and not to vex you needlessly. I have told your unfortunate story to no one. What for? Any secret may be a treasure, which he who tells gives away there are however occasions in which an exchange of secrets may be made with profit for instance i am going to tell you an important secret of mine which will serve as security for yours and which will oblige us to be friends for the rest of our lives i am listening go on responding the renegade quietly aban karime then read aloud the arabic document which juan fagueira listened to without moving a muscle of his still angry countenance the moor seeing this in order to dispel his distrust disclosed to him the fact that he had stolen the paper he had just read from a christian in ceuta the spaniard smiled slightly to think how great must be the huckster's fear of him to cause him voluntarily to reveal to him his theft and poor manos gordas encouraged by ben munuza's smile proceeded to disclose his plans in the following terms i take it for granted that you understand perfectly well the importance of this document and the reason of my reading it to you i know not where the tower of zoraya nor aldeir nor el Senet is nor do i know how to go to spain nor should i be able to find my way through that country if i were there besides which the people would kill me for not being a christian or at least they would despoil me of the treasure after i had found it if not before for all these reasons i require that a trusty and loyal spaniard should accompany me a man whose life shall be in my power and whom i can send to the gallows with half a word a man in short like you juan falgueira who after all have gained nothing by robbing and murdering since you are now toiling here like a donkey when with the millions i am going to procure you you can go to america to france or to india and enjoy yourself and live in luxury and rise in time perhaps to be king what do you think of my plan that is well put together like the work of a moor responded ben munuza in whose nervous hands clasped behind his back the iron bar swung back and forth like a tiger's tail manos gorda smiled with satisfaction thinking that his proposition was already accepted but added the sombre galician there is one thing you have not considered and what is that asked ben Karime, throwing back his head with a comical expression and fixing his eyes on vacancy like one who is prepared to hear some trivial and easily answered objection you have not considered that i should be an unmitigated fool if i were to accompany you to spain to put you in possession of half a treasure relying upon your putting me in possession of the other half i say this because you would only have to say half a word the day we arrived in aldeir and you thought yourself free from danger to rid yourself of my company and avoid giving me my half of the treasure after it was found in truth you are not the clever man you imagine yourself to be but only a simpleton deserving of pity who have deliberately walked into a trap from which there is no escape in telling me where this great treasure is to be found and telling me at the same time that you know my history and that if i were to accompany you to spain you would there be absolute master of my life and what need then have i of you what need have i of your help to go and take possession of the entire treasure myself what need have i of you in the world at all who are you now that you have read me the document now that i can take it from you what are you saying cried manos gordas who all at once felt a chill like that of death strike to the marrow of his bones i am saying nothing take that replied juan falgueira dealing ben karime a tremendous blow on the head with the iron bar the moor rolled over on the ground the blood gushing from his eyes nose and mouth without uttering a single sound the unfortunate man was dead three or four weeks after the death of manos gordas somewhere about twentieth of february eighteen twenty one it was snowing if it ever were to snow in the town of aldeir and throughout the beautiful andalusian sierra to which the snow gives existence as it were and a name it was carnival sunday and the church bell was for the fourth time summoning to mass with its thin clear tones like those of a child 
the shivering christians of the parish too near to heaven for their comfort who found it difficult on so raw and inclement a day to bring themselves to leave their beds or to move away from the fire saying perhaps an excuse for their not doing so that on the three days before ash wednesday worship should be rendered not to god but to the devil some such excuse as this at least was given by uncle juan gomez in answer to the arguments with which his pious wife our friend dame torquata tried to persuade him to give up drinking brandy and eating biscuits and accompany her instead to mass like a good christian regardless of the criticism of the schoolmaster or the other electors of the liberal party and the dispute was beginning to grow warm when suddenly Gennaro, his honour's head shepherd, entered the kitchen, and taking off his hat, and scratching his head with the same movement, said, God give us good day, Senor Juan and Senora Torquata. You must have guessed already that something has happened up above to bring me down here on a day like this, it not being my Sunday for going to hear mass. I hope you are both well. There, there, I'll wait no longer, cried the alcalde's wife impatiently, folding her mantilla over her breast. It was decreed that you were not to hear mass to-day. You have drink enough there, and conversation enough for the whole day, discussing the question as to whether the goats are with kid, or whether the young rams are beginning to get their horns. You will go to perdition, Juan you will go to perdition if you don't soon make your peace with the church and give up the accursed alcaldeship when dan torquata had departed the alcalde handed a biscuit and a glass of brandy to the head shepherd saying women's nonsense uncle gennaro draw your chair up to the fire and tell me what you have to say what is going on up above there oh a mere nothing Yesterday Francisco, the goat-keeper, saw a man dressed like a native of Malaga, with long trousers and a linen jacket, and wrapped in a blanket, go into the cattle-yard you are making from the open side, and walk around the moor's tower examining it and measuring it as if he were a master-builder. Francisco asked him what he was doing, to which the stranger answered by asking in his turn who was the owner of the tower, and Francisco saying that he was no less a person than the alcalde of the town, the stranger replied that he would speak with his honour and explain his plans to him. Night soon fell, and as the man pretended to be going away, the goat herd went to his hut, which, as you know, is but a short distance from the tower. Some two hours later the same Francisco noticed that strange noises proceeded from the tower, in which he also observed a light burning, all which terrified him so greatly that he did not even venture to go to my hut to tell me of what he had seen and heard. This he did as soon as it was daylight, saying in addition that the noises he had heard in the tower were kept up all night as i am an old man and have served my king and am not easily frightened i went at once to the moor's tower accompanied by francisco who trembled at every step he took and we discovered the stranger wrapped up in his blanket asleep in a little room on the ground floor where the plaster still remains on the ceiling i wakened the mysterious stranger and reproved him for spending the night in a strange house without its owner's permission to which he answered that the building was not a house but a heap of ruins where a poor wayfarer might very well take shelter on a snowy night and that he was ready to present himself before you and tell you who he was and what his business and his plans were i have brought him with me therefore and he is now out in the yard with the goat herd waiting for your permission to enter let him come in answered uncle hormiga rising to his feet greatly disturbed for the thought had presented itself to his mind at the head shepherd's first words that all this was closely connected with the celebrated treasure the hope of discovering which by his own unaided exertions he had abandoned a week before after he had removed without result several of the heaviest of the foundation stones here then we have face to face and alone uncle juan gomez and the stranger what is your name the former asked the latter with all the imperiousness warranted by his exalted office and without inviting him to be seated my name is jaime olot responded the mysterious stranger you do not speak like a native of this country are you english i am a catalan ah a catalan that may be and what brings you to these parts and above all what the devil were you doing yesterday measuring my tower 
I will tell you. I am a miner by profession, and I have come to this country which is famous for its copper and silver mines in search of work. Yesterday afternoon, passing by the Moors Tower, I saw that a wall was being built with the stones that had been taken from it, and that it would be necessary to tear down a great deal more of the building in order to finish the wall. There is no one who can equal me in pulling down buildings, whether by the use of tools or with hands only, for I have the strength of an ox, and the idea occurred to me that I might be able to make a contract with the owner of the tower to pull it down and dig up the foundation stones. Uncle Hormiga, with a wink of his little grey eyes, responded, dwelling upon every word, well the arrangement does not suit me i would do the work for very little almost nothing now it would suit me less than before the so-called jaime olot was puzzled not a little by the mysterious answers of uncle juan gomez and he tried to get some clue to their meaning from the expression of his face but as he was unsuccessful in his efforts to read the fox-like countenance of his honour he added with faint naturalness it would not displease me either to repair a part of the old building and to live there cultivating the ground that you had intended for a cattle yard i will buy from you then the moor's tower with the ground around it i do not wish to sell it responded uncle hormiga but i will pay you double what it is worth said the self-styled catalan emphatically it would suit me now less than ever to sell it replied the andalusian with so crafty and insulting a look that his interlocutor took a step backward suddenly becoming conscious that he was treading on false ground he reflected for a moment therefore and then raising his head with a determined air and clasping his hands behind his back he said with a cynical laugh so then you know that there is a treasure on that ground uncle juan gomez leaned over in his seat and scanning the catalan from head to foot exclaimed with a comical air what vexes me is that you too should know it and it would vex you much more if i should tell you that i am the only person who knows it with certainty that is to say that you know the precise spot in which the treasure is buried i know the precise spot and it would not take me twenty-four hours to disinter all the wealth that lies hidden there according to that you have in your possession a certain document yes i have a document of the time of the moors half a yard square in which all the necessary directions to find the treasure are given and tell me this document i do not carry it about with me nor is there any reason why i should do so since i know it word for word by heart both in spanish and in arabic oh i am not such a fool as ever to deliver myself up bag and baggage to the enemy so that before coming to this country i conceal the document where no one but myself will ever be able to find it in that case there is no more to be said senor jaime olot let us come to an understanding like two good friends exclaimed the alcalde at the same time pouring out a glass of brandy for the stranger let us come to an understanding repeated the stranger taking a seat without waiting for further permission and drinking his brandy with gusto tell me continued uncle hormiga and tell me without lying so that i may learn to put faith in you ask what you wish when it does not suit me to speak i shall be silent do you come from madrid no it's twenty-five years since i was in the capital for the first and last time do you come from the holy land no that is not in my line are you acquainted with a lawyer of ujihar called don matias de quesada no i hate lawyers and all people who live by the pen well then how did this document fall into your possession jaime olcott was silent i like that i see you don't want to lie exclaimed the alcalde but there cannot be a doubt that don matias de quesada cheated me as if i were a chinese stealing from me two ounces in gold and then selling the document to some one in meleila or ceuta and the fact is although you are not a moor you look as if you had lived in those countries don't fatigue yourself or lose your time guessing further i will set your doubts at rest this lawyer you speak of must have sent the manuscript to a spaniard in ceuta from whom it was stolen three weeks ago by the moor from whose possession it passed into mine 
ah now i see he must have sent it to a nephew of his who is a musician in the cathedral of that city one bonifacio de tudela it is very likely what a wretched that don matias is to cheat his gossip in this way but see how chance has brought the document back to my hands again to mine you would say observed the stranger to ours returned the alcalde again filling the glasses why then we are millionaires we will divide the treasure equally between us since you cannot dig in that ground without my permission nor can i find the treasure without the help of the document which has fallen into your possession that is to say that chance has made us brothers from this day forth you shall live in my house another glass and the instant we have finished breakfast we will begin to dig the conference had reached this point when dame torquada returned from us her husband told her all that had passed and presented to her don jaime olot the good woman heard with as much fear as joy the news that the treasure was on the eve of discovery crossing herself repeatedly on learning of the treachery and baseness of her gossip don matias de quesada and she looked with terror at the stranger whose countenance filled her with a presentment of coming misfortune knowing however that she must give this man his breakfast she went into the pantry to take from it the choicest articles it contained that is to say a tender loin with pickle sauce and a sausage of the last killing saying to herself however as she uncovered the jars time it is that the treasure should be discovered for whether it is to be found or not it has already cost us thirty-two dollars for the famous cup of chocolate the long-standing friendship of our gossip don matias these fine slices of meat that would have made so rich a dish dressed with peppers and tomatoes in the month of august and the having so forbidding looking a stranger as a guest accursed be treasures and mines and the devils and everything that is underground excepting only water and the faithful departed while dame torquata was making these reflections to herself as she went with a pen in either hand toward the fire cries and hisses of women and children resounded in the street mingled with other voices in a lower key saying senor alcalde open the door the city authorities are entering the town with a troop of soldiers jaime olot became yellower than wax when he heard these words and clasping his hands together he said hide me senor alcalde otherwise we shall not find the treasure the authorities have come in search of me in search of you and why so are you a criminal i knew it cried down torquada from that gloomy face no good could come all this is the doing of lucifer quick quick resumed the stranger take me out by the back door very good but first give me directions where to find the treasure said uncle hormiga senor alcalde the cry was repeated outside the door open the town is surrounded it seems it is that man who has been shut up with you for the last hour they are in search of open to the authorities an imperious voice now cried accompanied by a loud knocking at the door there is no help for it said the alcalde going to open the door while the stranger tried to escape into the yard by the other door but the head shepherd and the goat herd who were on the alert cut off his egress and they and the soldiers who had now also entered the room seized and bound him securely although the renegade displayed in the struggle the strength and agility of a tiger the constable of the court who had under his command a clerk and twenty foot soldiers meantime told the alcalde the causes and reasons for these noisy arrests this man he said with whom you have been shut up i don't know why talking of i don't know what is the famous galician juan falgueira who fifteen years ago robbed and murdered a party of gentlemen whose muleteer he was in a certain hamlet in granada and who escaped from the chapel on the eve of the day appointed for his execution dressed in the habit of the friar who was administering to him the consolations of religion and whom he left there half strangled the king himself whom heaven preserve received a fortnight ago a letter from ceuta signed by a moor named manos gordas saying that juan falgueira after long residence in oran and other points in africa was about to embark for spain and that it would be an easy matter to seize him in aldeir in el senet where it was his intention to purchase a moorish tower and to devote himself to mining 
at the same time a communication was received by the government from the spanish consul in tetuan stating that a moorish woman called zamna had presented herself before him to make complaint against the spanish renegade ben manuza formerly called juan falgueira who had just sailed for spain after having assassinated the moor manas gordas the complainant's husband and robbed him of a certain precious document for all which reasons and chiefly on account of the attempt against the life of the friar in the chapel his majesty the king strongly urged upon the authorities of granada the arrest of the criminal and his immediate execution in that city let the reader picture to himself the terror and astonishment with which this narration was listened to by all present as well as the despair of uncle hormiga who could not now doubt that the document was in the possession of this man condemned to death the avaricious alcalde then at the risk of compromising himself still further called aside juan falgueira and held a whispered conversation with him having previously informed the assemblage that he was going to try to prevail upon the renegade to confess his crime before god and men what passed between the two partners however was really what follows gossip said uncle hormiga not heaven itself could now save you but you must feel that it would be a pity that that document should be lost tell me where you have hidden it gossip responded the galician with that document or in other words with the treasure it represents i intend to purchase my pardon procure for me the royal favour and i will deliver the document to you but for the present i shall offer it to the judges to bribe them to declare my sentence null and void by prescription gossip replied uncle hormiga you are a wise man and i shall be glad if you succeed in your purpose but if you fail for god's sake do not carry to the tomb a secret which will profit no one be certain i shall take it with me answered juan falgueira i must have my revenge upon the world in some way let us proceed here cried the constable putting an end to this strange conference and the condemned man being chained and handcuffed the officers of justice and the soldiers proceeded with him in the direction of the city of guadix whence they were to conduct him to granada the devil the devil the wife of uncle hormiga juan gomez kept repeating to herself for an hour afterward as she returned the tenderloin and the sausage to their respective jars my curse upon all treasures past present and to come needless to say that uncle hormiga found no means of procuring juan falgueira's pardon nor did the judges condescend to listen seriously to the offers which the latter made them of delivering to them a treasure on condition that they should relinquish the prosecution against him nor did the terrible galician consent to disclose the hiding-place of the document nor the whereabouts of the treasure to the bold alcalde of aldeire who with this hope had the face to visit him in the chapel in the prison of granada juan falgueira then was hanged on the friday preceding good friday in the paseo del triunfo and uncle hormiga on his return to aldeire on palm sunday fell ill with typhoid fever the disease running its course so quickly that on wednesday of holy week he confessed himself and made his will and expired on the morning of easter saturday but before his death he wrote a letter to don matias de quesada reproaching him with his treachery and dishonesty which had caused the deaths of three persons and forgiving him like a christian on condition that he should return to dame torquada the thirty-two dollars for the cup of chocolate this dreadful letter reached ujihar simultaneously with the news of the death of uncle juan gomez both which events coming together affected the old lawyer to such a degree that he never recovered his spirits again and he died shortly afterward having written in his last hour a terrible letter full of reproaches and maledictions to his nephew the chapelmaster ceuta accusing him of having deceived and robbed him and of being the cause of his death to the reading of this just and tremendous accusation was due it is said the stroke of apoplexy that sent don bonifacio to the tomb so that the suspicion merely of the existence of a hidden treasure was the cause of five deaths and of many other misfortunes matters remaining in the end as hidden and mysterious as they were in the beginning since dame torquata who was the only person in the world who knew the history of the fatal document took good care never to mention it thereafter in the whole course of her life 
thinking as she did that it had all been the work of the devil and the necessary consequence of her husband's dealings with the enemies of the church and the throne end of chapter six Chapter 7 of Stories by Foreign Authors, Spanish Authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories by Foreign Authors, Spanish Authors. Chapter 7 Bread Cast Upon the Waters by Fernand Caballero. Translated by Mary J. Serrano. Part 1 chapter one although the villages of the sierras of andalusia owing to their elevation enjoy in summer a milder temperature than those of the plains during the middle hours of the day the sun reflected from the rocks that abound in this mountainous region produces a dry and ardent heat which is more transitory indeed but also more irritating than that of the plains the chief sufferers from its ardours are the wandering reapers who after finishing the labours of the harvest in their own province go in search of work to the provinces where the harvest has not yet been gathered in the greater number of the reapers of the province of granada go to the sierra of ronda where they are welcomed and where their toilsome labours are well rewarded so that they are able to lay by some money unless indeed sickness that scourge of the poor prostrates them and consumes their earnings or terminates their existence in a more pious age a small hospital for poor strangers was established in bornos which is one of the villages that like a fringe border the slope of the sierra an hospital which remained closed in winter but which in summer received many of the poor reapers who were prostrated by the intense heat and who had no home or family in the village on a hot summer day early in the thirties a woman with a kind and gentle countenance was seated at the door of her cottage in the village above mentioned engaged in chopping the tomatoes and peppers and crumbling the bread for the wholesome nutritious and savoury gazpacho which was to serve for the family supper her two children a boy of seven and a girl of five were playing not far from her in the street as bornos is almost entirely surrounded by orchards and orange groves planted on the slopes of the tableland on which the village is seated and which at this hour are irrigated by the clear and abundant waters of its springs every breeze brought with it the perfume of the leaves and the melodious strains of the birds singing their evening hymn to the sun filling the air with coolness as if kind mother nature made of her trees a fan to cool the brow of her favourite child man the front of the house was already steeped in shadow while the sun still gilded the irregular crests of the mountains on the opposite side of the valley that like patient camels supported the load of vines olive groves and cornfields confided to them by man the mother occupied with her task had not observed that a poorly clad little boy had joined her children and that they were talking together who are you said the bornos boy to the stranger i have never seen you before what is your name michael and yours gaspar and my name is catherine said the little girl who desired also to make the strange boy's acquaintance i know the story of st catherine said the latter oh do you tell it to us the boy recited the following verses to-morrow will be st catherine's day when to heaven she will ascend and st peter will say what woman is that who asks to be let in i am catherine she will answer and i want to come in enter little dove in your dove-coat then what a lovely story exclaimed the girl do you know another look catherine cried her brother who was eating roasted beans there is a little dead snail in this bean a roasted snail will you give me some beans begged the strange child yes here are some are you very very fond of roasted beans yes very but i asked you for them because i am very hungry why have you had no dinner no nor any breakfast either no mother mother 
cried both the children together, running to their mother. "'This poor little boy hasn't had any dinner or any breakfast, and he is very hungry. Give us some bread for him.' "'He has had no dinner, you say?' said the good woman, giving the child a piece of bread, with that compassionate tenderness which seems innate in women toward children. "'Have you no parents, then, my child?' "'Yes, but they have no bread to give me.' "'Poor little boy! And where are your parents?' "'Over there,' answered the boy, pointing in the direction of a lane that ran between garden walls at right angles with the street." The good woman, followed by the children, went to the lane. On the dry grass, with his face turned to the wall, lay a man, miserably clad and apparently lifeless. A handkerchief was tied round his head. Near him lay a sickle that had fallen from his nerveless grasp. Seated on the ground beside him was a woman, who, with her thin cheek resting on her emaciated hand, was gazing fixedly at him through the tears that rolled down her sad face, as on a rainy day the water trickles down the walls of a deserted ruin. The last rays of the setting sun, lingering in the lane, illumined the melancholy group with a light tender and sorrowful as a farewell glance. Approaching the stranger, the good woman, whose name was Maria, said to her, Senora, what is the matter with your husband? He has a fever that is killing him, answered the stranger, bursting into sobs. "'Holy Mary!' cried the mother of the children compassionately. "'And why don't you let people know about it and ask them to help you? "'Are we living in a heathen land, then?' "'I don't know anyone in the place.' "'No matter. For a neighbourly act, acquaintance isn't necessary. "'What is this poor man to be left alone to die as if he were among the moors? "'Not if I can prevent it.' At this moment a man with a strong, calm, and kind face approached the group. "'Father! Father!' cried the children. "'This man is dying, and this little boy, who is his son, says he has no bread to give him.' "'John Joseph,' added the mother of the children, "'this poor man is lying shelterless here. This is pitiful. If you are willing, let us carry him into the house and send for the doctor.' "'Willing? Of course I am willing,' answered the husband. "'I have never yet refused my help to any one in need of it, God be praised.' There has always been a corner in my kitchen for the poor, and especially for those who are looking for a shelter for the night, who are on a journey, or who are sick, and such food as I had I have always shared with them. Don't you know that, wife? Come, then, said the latter. Let us lift him up, John Joseph. I'll take hold of him by one arm, and his wife can take him by the other. They did as she said. One of the children took the sickle, another the hat, the third a small shabby bundle of clothes, and all went toward the house. A sheepskin and a pair of sheets were spread over one of the thick reed mattings, which served the labourers in the farm and vineyards as beds, and the sick man, who remained sunk in a profound stupor, was placed on it, while Gasparito, who was told to fly, ran for the doctor. When the latter came, he pronounced the patient to be dangerously ill, and prescribed various medicines which were administered to him with that zeal and intelligence in caring for the sick that is one of the many prerogatives of the sex called the fair but which might with much more propriety be called the pious sex after the medicines had been administered and he had been bled freely the patient seemed somewhat better and sank into what seemed a natural and beneficent sleep and then and not until then did the family think of their supper, the refreshing and nutritious gazpacho, and the fruits so abundant in the country, and of which the people, frugal, refined, and elegant, even in their material appetites, are so fond. CHAPTER Two. It is needless to say that those first called to partake of the mess, as the master of the house, who had been a soldier, called it, were the strange woman and her son. "'And what part of the country are you from?' said John Joseph to his guest, as he offered her a slice of a magnificent watermelon, which sparkled like a garnet in the light. "'From Trevelez, in the Alpujarras,' she answered. "'I was there when I served the king,' responded John Joseph. "'Those are poor villages. Trevelez is a village overhanging the ravine of Pokira.' "'That is true,' replied the poor woman, whose sorrowful face brightened a little at the recollection so dear to the heart, 
of the place where she was born and where her home was and by the same token continued john joseph you can see from there the peaks of mullah hasim and velita that don't reach the sky because the almighty wouldn't let them and not because they didn't try and why do they call that peak the velita a weather vane john joseph is it because it has one on it if it has i never saw it it has none now said the stranger but it had one in former times when moors and christians were fighting one another through the mountains it was guarded by an angel who kept it pointed towards spain and then the christians conquered but if he neglected his task the devil came and made it point toward barbary and then the moors conquered but in spite of all the devil could do we drove them out yes and we would have done it if there had been ten times as many of them said the ex-soldier and were you ever on those peaks said the mistress of the house to her guest i was never there myself answered the latter but my manuel has been there a hundred times once he went there with an englishman who wanted to see them between the two peaks there is a ravine that is full of water and that is a cauldron that the demons made from the middle of it come strange sounds that are caused by a hammering of the demons mending the cauldron the whole place is a desert full of naked rocks and so awesome and solitary that the englishman said it was like the dead sea a sea that it seems there is in some of those far-off countries oh mother and why did it die asked the girl how should i know answered the mother father said the girl repeating her question why did that sea die did the moors kill it what a question returned the father who did not wish to confess his ignorance of the matter as his wife had done it died because everything in the world dies even the seas and is the whole mountain like that asked maria no for lower down there are trees chestnuts oaks and shrubs and some fine apple trees planted by the moors whose fruit is sent to granada to be sold and i was told continued john joseph that there are wild goats there that run faster than water down a hill that leap like grasshoppers and that are so sagacious that they always station one of their number on a height to keep watch and when danger is approaching he strikes the rock with his foot and then the others scamper off and disappear like a flight of partridges that is all true responded the guest and there are owls there too a kind of birds with wings and a human face what is that you are saying senora said john joseph who ever saw such birds as those my manuel has seen them and every one who has ever climbed up those heights and you must know that the owls and the mountain goats have been there ever since the time when jesus was in the world he came to those solitudes that were then shady meadows in which tame and handsome goats browsed watched by their shepherds the lord who was tired entered a goat herd's hut and asked the goat herds to prepare a kid for supper for himself and st john and st peter who were with him the goat herds who were wicked moors said that they had none but the lord insisted and then what did those heartless wretches do they killed a cat cooked it and set it on the table but the lord as you may suppose who sees into all hearts and knows everything that is going on however secret it may be thought knew perfectly well what the goat herds had done and sitting down at the table he said if you are a kid remain fried but if you are a cat jump from the plate instantly the animal straightened itself up and ran off the lord to punish the goat herds turned them into owls and their flocks into wild goats at this moment a moan was heard they all hurried to the sick man's bedside his improvement had only been momentary the fever caused by a cerebral attack had reached its height and in a few hours terminated his life without his having returned to consciousness for a single instant it is an easy matter to describe a violent and noisy grief which rebels against misfortune but it is not easy to describe a profound silent humble and resigned grief the poor widow who had lost everything even the strength to work raised her eyes to heaven clasped her hands and bowed her head while her life which her chilled heart was unable to maintain slowly ebbed away she was not sent away by the kind and charitable people who had sheltered her 
but she knew that she would be a heavy burden upon them and although she was submissive to the will of the lord she prayed to him to grant her a speedy and contrite end as a release from all her sufferings and the lord granted her prayer one night she saw with ineffable joy the bed on which she lay surrounded by kind devout and compassionate souls the house was lighted up an altar stood in front of her humble cot on which she saw the image of our lord to whom she had prayed with arms opened to those who call upon him every one brought flowers those universal interpreters of human feeling which enhanced the splendour of the most august solemnities and lend poetry and beauty to the gayest festival and which as if they were angels gifts are found like these in the hut and in the palace in royal gardens and in the fields a bell sounded in the distance that with its silvery voice seemed to say here cometh the lord who giveth a peaceful death and thus it was for when the solemn act of receiving the last sacrament was ended the sick woman raised her eyes in which a gleam of her lost happiness shone i am leaving this valley of tears she said in a faint voice and through the mercy of god i am going to his presence to ask him to watch over this poor boy this poor orphan orphan did you say cried john joseph don't you know then that he is our son the dying woman leaned her pale face against her son's forehead on which a tear fell and said to him child of my heart pay to our benefactors your own debt and that of your parents as for me i can only pray to god that he will bless them as i bless them john joseph said the priest the blessing of the dying is the most precious legacy they can leave to those who survive them chapter three in eighteen fifty three gaspar and michael who had grown up together like two brothers had arrived at the age of manhood and they were as honest and industrious as the father who had guided them catherine was a beautiful girl as modest and as diligent as the mother at whose side she had grown up michael who had a noble and affectionate and consequently a grateful heart loved the family who had adopted him with ardent affection but especially did he love catherine for whom he felt all the affection of a brother joined to all the tenderness of a lover toward her whom he desired to make the companion of his life many days of tranquil happiness were enjoyed by these united and worthy people but as happiness like the blue of the sky cannot be lasting for the earth to yield its fruits requires the rain and man to estimate at their true value this life and the next has need of tears a time came in which many were shed in this house to prove to its inmates that god bestows this blessing almost preferably on the poor and the righteous the draft was proclaimed and both sons were enrolled for the drawing those who know how passionate is the affection which the mothers of the people have for their children can understand maria's inconsolable grief she believed that she loved both sons equally she feared for both with the same anguish with the same fervour she prayed to god and to the virgin that both might escape the draught but when they returned from the drawing and she heard that the soldier's lot had fallen on her own son the cry which this intelligence drew from her mother's heart child of my soul i knew that it must fall upon you showed that a mother's love can be equalled by no other michael saw maria's grief with a breaking heart a grief which not all his own efforts nor those of her husband could diminish or soothe on the following day john joseph took his son to the barrack but what was the astonishment of both when the commandant told gaspar that he was free and that he might return home free cried gaspar in amazement and why because you have a substitute answered the officer i said gaspar with ever-increasing astonishment why that can't be so why do you say it can't be so if the substitute is already accepted and enrolled it is so but who is he asked gaspar amazed that young man there answered the officer pointing to the man whom his parents in their beneficence had brought up as a son michael what have you done exclaimed gaspar strongly moved what my mother charged me on her deathbed to do answered michael i have paid a debt you owe me nothing 
answered gaspar but i now owe you a debt and god grant me the opportunity to pay it brother if the occasion presents itself you may be sure i will not let it pass that i will not chapter four two years after the events just recorded a still greater sorrow befell this worthy family so united and so affectionate as the families of the peasantry usually are michael drew the lot in the second conscription as gaspar had done before and as he was thus obliged to serve on his own account the son of his adopted parents whom he could not now serve as a substitute was once more called to the ranks four years more passed and just when they were expecting michael home his time of service having expired and while catherine was preparing her wedding garments a cry uttered by the queen of spain resounded through the country electrifying the people and producing a universal outburst of patriotic enthusiasm long live spain death to the moor who has insulted her this cry was re-echoed throughout the length and breadth of the peninsula accompanied by the clash of the warrior's sword and the chink of the rich man's gold offered on the altar of the country's honour it was repeated by the people who gave their blood by the sacred episcopate who blessed the cause of the country and of christianity and whose words powerfully influenced not only timid and pious consciences but all by their wisdom prudence and judgment the sisters of charity offered their devoted services the nuns made lint and sacred scapulars of the virgin the ladies also made lint and bandages which they moistened with their tears and even schoolboys fired with enthusiasm asked to be allowed to go to the popular war against the moors note this assertion may be proved by many examples but it will suffice to transcribe here a letter written by a nephew of mine the son of marquis c Quote, senor governor although i am only a boy of eight i am moved to say to you that i would like to die for the country and that being fond of military things i wish you would permit me to go fight the moors written by p p End quote. it is to be observed that this boy is docile and gentle and modest in disposition rather than daring or arrogant note of the author End note michael who shared in the general enthusiasm for the war on receiving his discharge enlisted again refusing to accept the premium for re-enlisting for such time as the war in africa should last john joseph who in winter followed the occupation of a muleteer brought home this news on his return from one of his trips in which he had seen his sons who were both serving in the king's regiment in africa maria on hearing it burst into tears they were right in saying last year when the saddle-shaped comet appeared that it came to foretell a war with the moors she exclaimed disconsolately the comet had no resemblance to a saddle answered her husband with martial ardour you know very well that what they said was that it was the same star that had guided the kings who went to bethlehem to declare that christ was the true messiah very well our people will go to the moorish country now to tell them that spanish christians are tired of putting up with the atrocities and the insults of the accursed moors but a great many people will be killed in this war john joseph and that is heartbreaking to think of yes heartbreaking although you with your warlike notions say it is not oh yes you would like this war to be like a war between women a war to the knife but without any one killed well war with those who use a beard and especially if they wear the king's uniform and have the flag of spain under which they are fighting to defend is another matter with them the question is to conquer or die for that very reason replied maria disconsolately couldn't he have come back and stayed quietly at home after he had fulfilled his duty yes like you at the spinning wheel but you must know that no new sailing vessel ever yet wanted to be a pontoon don't you know that maria and catherine kept on crying if you had even told me that you were going to see them said the former i would have given you some scapulars to take to them they have them already they have them already and blessed by the bishop of malaga i told you before wife that this war is a holy war which will rejoice st ferdinand in heaven but you are in a crying humour it seems 
he added impatiently, seeing that his wife and daughter were still shedding tears. "'Why, what would you have, that they should remain here like women "'instead of going to throttle those accursed Moors "'who don't believe in Christ, who deny his holy mother, "'and who call the Spaniards hens and Christian dogs? "'But let them wait a bit, and I'll warrant "'they won't want a second taste of the broth whose hens will make them. "'They never catch a Spaniard, even in time of peace, "'that they don't quarter or impale him. "'You see that makes every Spaniard's blood boil.' I don't know how I can contain myself that I don't go too, for I tell you that the soles of my feet are itching to go, and the day you least expect it I'll take my gun and my blanket and join the camp. John Joseph, in the Virgin's name, isn't it enough to have your sons there? Would you leave us entirely alone? It wouldn't be for long. Hush, hush, God only knows how long it will be, for those people are in their own country, defending their homes— and you know that they are ferocious savage fearless and valiant that they are but as far as being fearless and valiant is concerned we spaniards are more so and god knows what hunger and privation they are going to suffer don't imagine it but even if it should be so give the spanish soldier plenty of water to drink and he has all he needs why the joy of that regiment as they went on board was plain to see and to think that i couldn't have gone with them john joseph in the virgin's name don't indulge in those boyish explosions remember you are sixty-five years old to-day i am twenty wife i am twenty do you hear your fiery spirit deceives you and i won't hear you talk about going to the war when you have two sons in it already and if i had more sons they should be in it too do you think that I should be behind the father of the first soldier killed in the taking of the Serayo, who, when he heard of his son's death, called another son, took him to the alcalde of his village, and said, My son has been killed in the war in Africa. Here is another to take his place. From what you say, I shouldn't wonder if you had urged Michael to go to the war. Michael didn't need any urging. Michael has done well, and so I told him, Go without fear. I cried to him as I came away, the weather vane in your village points for Spain, and don't lose heart. If there should be some reverse, for reverses there must be in war, unless it be by a miracle of God. But many there won't be, and the devil will have little chance to get at the weather vane at the peak of the Alpujarras. For the one who has charge of it now is an archangel, your patron saint Michael, and the patron saint of Spain, and he won't neglect his business, and he knows how to keep the devil at a respectful distance. End of section 7by Fernand Caballero, translated by Mary J. Serrano. Part 2. Chapter 5. Not long afterward, John Joseph went with his mule for a load of pears to Ronda. He found that from there he could go without much difficulty to the Christian camp in Africa. Why then, he said to himself, I can sell my pears there, as well as in Jerez or Malaga. There I will go then. In that way I shall see my boys and the fighting that is going on, which will be something worth seeing. And so he went. Catherine and Maria were far from suspecting anything of this when, six or eight days later, John Joseph returned home. After he had taken the mule to the stable and put away his things with much deliberation, he sat down and said to his wife and daughter, The boys send many remembrances and hope that when you receive them, you will be enjoying as good health as they are enjoying at present. Why, what are you saying, John Joseph? I am saying that the boys have sent you many remembrances. Have you had a letter from them? No, I am the letter myself. You? Why, what do you mean by that? That I went to Morocco, and have come back again without losing my way, with my mule, or a hero who showed little surprise when, on arriving in that strange country, we found ourselves in the midst of noise and confusion, moors everywhere, bands playing, guns firing. 
holy mary and what did you go there for rash man to sell some pears that i got an excellent price for to see the boys whom i found in good health and as gay as larks and to kill three moors who will never again call any spaniard christian dog so you see wife that i have not lost my journey and you did that god help us cried the good woman crossing herself you killed three moors did you say you would not have been able to do that unless they had been unarmed or had been taken prisoners or had surrendered and you did that maria what are you saying responded her husband do you know that to kill an unarmed man would be contrary to the laws of honour and the work of an executioner don't you know that to kill a man who has surrendered would be a vile deed and would be to make oneself a butcher of men don't you know that to kill a man who asks quarter would be the deed of a miscreant and a coward and would disgrace the name of christian and dishonour the name of spaniard in honourable combat i killed them maria when with arms in their hands they tried to kill me and my companions i know well that the glory is not in killing but in conquering the enemy and i wouldn't want at the hour of my death to have to remember killing any man by treachery i tell you so help me god that i killed them honourably like a brave man and may they all die thus for they won't surrender not even with the bayonet at their breasts mercy cried maria and why not because their holy men have made them believe that the spaniards are as ferocious as themselves and that we burn alive the wounded and the prisoners we take you thought that only young chaps were good for the war and that i with my sixty-five years would be of no use in it well you were mistaken you see you were mistaken for i am of good quality and although the steel is worn off the iron remains do you understand and i am a brave soldier but not an assassin do you understand forgive me john joseph i didn't stop to think it is plain you didn't stop to think and you didn't remember either that your husband is a christian of the old stock and a well-born spaniard and that he knows how to fight the enemies of his faith of his country and of his queen but that he will never dishonour himself by killing a defenceless man nor debase himself by putting to death a man who has surrendered nor make a tiger of himself by refusing his life to a man who asks it not even if he were barabbas himself were ours winning john joseph to be sure they were winning all the time past present and future but i have heard them say that a great many more moors are coming with a brother of their king whom they call muley abbas let them come that is just what we want but don't imagine that those moors that are with the king are like the rif moors who are the most savage and the fiercest of all the moors but all of them together could do nothing against the division of Eshag, which has covered itself with glory in the war. Queen Isabel may well be proud of her soldiers, but as I was telling you when I arrived in Algeciras, I embarked with my mule and my pears, and you know that I have no fancy for travelling by sea, for the mule that falls on the road doesn't get up again. I landed at Ceuta, and from there I went with my mule and my pears to the camp, and when i saw the flag of spain floating over the serrallo my heart swelled so that my breast could hardly contain it i reached the camp and sold my pears like lightning for there is no want of money there nor the will to spend it what a hubbub maria it seemed like the gayest kind of a fair nothing was to be heard but the twang of guitars singing and hurrahs for the queen i need only tell you that the commander-in-chief has had to forbid so much singing and guitar playing at night because it served as a guide to the accursed moors i was just inquiring for the king's regiment when the bugle sounded our soldiers seized their guns crying long live spain and advanced to the attack i left my mule there and followed them and you may believe me that the sight was worth seeing and one that would have set the blood coursing in a dead man's veins each of our soldiers was a bernardo every officer a pizarro every general a cid one might have thought that santiago himself on his white horse was at the head of the army so completely did they rout the moors who are all warriors and who were three times as many as we i could not tell you all i saw not if i had a hundred tongues i saw general quesada seize a gun and lead the bayonet charge himself 
ah brave son of a brave father i said to myself for i had served under his father and he was another of the right kind but why do i say another when they are all of the right kind i saw the bullets flying over the head of the commander-in-chief as thick as comfits in carnival i saw the regiment of granada with its valiant commander colonel trio at its head make a bayonet charge crying long live the queen that made the moors fly in terror from the field and i heard the commander-in-chief say to the colonel that the exploit deserved a decoration to which the generous colonel replied nothing for me general the credit belongs to my battalion i heard the commander-in-chief say to a group of soldiers of the granada regiment how goes it boys have you received your baptism yet yes general answered the soldiers and the moors have paid dear for the christening in short maria if i was to tell you of all i saw there i should keep on talking till the day of judgment but the ones i never lost sight of maria were our two boys and you may imagine how well they must have fought when the commander-in-chief who was near by observed them and going up to michael he said you have fought well now tell me what do you wish to keep on fighting general answered michael and on the instant the general gave him the cross of st ferdinand i cannot tell you how i felt but i thought i should go out of my wits with joy i could not contain myself and i was running to embrace him when i saw one of those crazy howlers stab one of our soldiers who fell down beside me so i said seizing the wounded man's gun you won't have a chance to kill another brave christian and with that i dispatched him and as i had joined the dance i dispatched two others and i made a bayonet charge with the boys that put wings to the feet of the moors for if they have a heavy hand for the fight they have a light foot for flight then night coming on i gave up the gun and went to look for my mule who had not found that dance of moors and christians to his liking and who i learned on inquiry had gone like a mule of peace to the shelter of the walls of Suta that night a storm arose that i don't believe had its equal since the world began i thought the sea the wind and the rain together would bring the world to an end but the next morning we were all as if nothing had happened and if the devil had sent that and others like it at the instance of his friend mahoma to terrify his enemies they might both have been convinced that spaniards are not to be terrified either by the roaring of the elements or the howling of their ferocious moors well as i was saying next morning i got up and walked to the camp to have a chat with the boys for as i told you the moors had prevented me from doing so the day before when i arrived i found the king's regiment drawn up in line with its band and all what may this be for i said to myself the sentry on guard was as mute and as motionless as a statue so that it isn't because there are moors in sight and why is this regiment drawn up and not the others this was beginning to excite my curiosity i drew near the band was playing away when the colonel taking his place in front of the regiment commanded silence and said in a loud voice so that all might hear him the commander-in-chief has learned with great satisfaction that on the afternoon of the twenty fourth of november a soldier of the king's regiment which i have the honour to command seeing his companion and friend wounded and in the hands of the moors and animated by the noblest sentiments fixed his bayonet and throwing himself heroically upon the moors and striking down those who attempted to stop him seized his wounded friend threw him over his shoulder more regardful of his friend's life than of his own snatching him from certain death carried him back to the ranks and desiring to recompense in view of the whole regiment the soldier who in so admirable a manner unites in himself the gallantry of the soldier and the piety of the christian transmits to him this gold medal which the cadiz athenaeum has provided and caused to be engraved with the object of making it an honourable reward for an act of surpassing merit and to give to him before his regiment drawn up in line so that it may serve as a stimulus to the brave and generous soldier referred to the old man's voice up to this time so animated here failed him and he was unable to proceed well said his wife deeply moved by the story she had been listening to why do you stop john joseph go on i can't get the words out there's a lump in my throat for the soldier whose name was called and who stepped from the ranks to receive the gold medal was 
was who why do you stop he was my son he was gaspar child of my heart and the virgin has kept him safe for me cried maria my darling brother and he saved michael's life murmured catherine and he killed three moors oh the good son honour of my grey hairs added john joseph with enthusiastic tenderness there was a moment's silence during which tears choked the utterance of these simple people and they could only clasp their hands and raise their eyes to heaven when he had somewhat recovered from his emotion john joseph continued his recital in these words when the ceremony was over i went in search of my boys i cannot describe maria what i felt when i saw them the one with his gold medal and the other with his cross of st ferdinand but what i can say is that the queen herself can't feel prouder with her crown and sceptre than i felt with my gaspar and my michael if gaspar was happy michael was happier still his eyes danced with joy the other seemed dazed good my son good i said to him that's the way spaniards behave when they are fighting for their country their queen and their faith remembering that the soldier who is brave and not humane is brave only as the brutes are you have deserved the medal son and your father's blessing with it why what did i do said gaspar who like all really brave men is neither proud nor boastful and holds himself for less not more than he is really worth you saved your brother's life i replied and by so heroic an act that it will be written in letters of gold added michael why nonsense answered gaspar putting his arm around his brother's neck i have done nothing but pay a debt i owed and spain has paid the debt she owed to the moors and with interest i said and i fancy they won't be likely to try their tricks again so you see wife all the advantages the war has brought us hurrah for the war john joseph returned his wife we mustn't forget because it has been favourable to us and that perhaps owing to that poor mother's dying blessing the many evils to which war gives rise the unhappy people who suffer those who are left disabled those who die and all the families who are at this moment weeping and in mourning for war is a calamity and therefore we ought to pray to god with all our hearts and souls for peace for the song of the angels is glory to god in the highest and peace on earth to men of good will chapter six two months later that is to say toward the middle of january john joseph and his wife and his daughter were seated one evening around the brazier the sky had been covered for several days with heavy clouds that sent down their rain with a steadiness not usual in storms the wind that came from the levant roared as if it brought with them to terrify spain the menacing howls of the savage children of africa and the growling of its lions who knows what they may be going through now said catherine in a voice choked with emotion ah merciful god answered her mother with swamps for a floor tents that let the water through for shelter and the cholera killing them by hundreds and the moors lying in ambush for them or treacherously following them and those eternal nights that swallow up the days there is no strength nor courage that could, that could bear up against so many ills and that is not the worst said john joseph with the thoughtless frankness of the peasant bringing his foot heavily down on the floor and raising his eyes to heaven what there are worse things yet said maria anxious and surprised why what else is there john joseph what else speak out hunger answered her husband in a funereal voice holy mary cried the poor mother in terror what is that you say man and the provisions then provisions they cannot get there they must be sent by sea from spain and although they took plenty with them when they get used up more must be sent and with these storms to which there is neither stop nor stay not even the birds could cross the strait those are the chances of war maria and if it has pleased God to send his storms precisely in these days, it must be to put our courage and our constancy to the proof, Maria, so that we may go to him and ask his help, and so that the victory, being more dearly bought, may be the more brilliant and the more prized. Or oh, the sufferings and the death of our soldiers are more deeply felt and bitterly lamented, 
returned his wife. Merciful God! Tempestuous weather, an epidemic, fierce and treacherous enemies around them, and hunger. Who would not lose heart with all this? The Spanish soldier, Maria. And will the generals and the great people come back? Neither the one nor the other, Maria. And if any of them should be obliged to come back because they are sick or wounded, it will be in grief and rage, and only because they can't help themselves. I know them, Maria. I know them. What, are they all going to perish, then? Don't imagine it, for God and the Holy Virgin will bring them safely through. Hold that for an article of faith. Let us ask them to do it, then, groaned the unhappy mother. Mother of the Forsaken, where are my sons? What has become of them? Are they alive? If they are, what will they not be suffering, and what will they not suffer in the future, if thou dost not protect them? How their hearts will be filled with anguish, and their minds with despair! Holy Mother, if I only had news of them, even! Let us pray to the Virgin to intercede for them. The family began to recite the rosary, with the fervour that changes anguish to hope, and sorrow to resignation, and scarcely had they ended when a little boy called out from the door. Uncle John Joseph, my father says there is a letter in the post office for you, and that it is from the Christian's camp over yonder. John Joseph, with the activity of twenty years, hurried out of the house, while Maria and her daughter, falling on their knees before an image of the Virgin, raised their clasped hands in prayer. John Joseph soon returned, bringing with him one of his cronies who knew how to read, and proceeded to read aloud the letter which the former had carried in his trembling hand. My dear parents, I hope that when you receive this you will be enjoying as good health as I desire for myself. Michael and I are well, and at your service. The cholera is raging again, but we laugh at it. Every day of action is a day of pleasure and enjoyment for us for it is happiness enough for us to win glory for our country and to see the enthusiasm of everybody, for this increases every day, as well among us of the ranks as among the officers and generals, and which shows most it would be hard to say. The mess has been a little scanty in these last days, because the sea was fiercer than the moors themselves, and the boats were unable to reach us with the supplies, but what matter, the worst of it was that we had no tobacco and so it happened that the commander-in-chief who came among us encouraging us like a greatly respected but very careful father came up to me and said well my boy are you very hungry and i answered him the hunger is nothing general if i only had a cigarette and what do you think he did he went to his tent and brought from it an enormous box of cigars that the queen had presented to him for the campaign and saying that her majesty would be glad that they should serve to lighten the labours of her faithful servants he distributed them among us we have received provisions thanks to the navy that on this occasion did not seem the sister but the mother of the army and as for that brave general bustillo a hundred lives if we had them wouldn't be enough to pay him for all he has done for us hurrah for the navy father notwithstanding that your worship doesn't like the sea you must know father that a prince of the royal house of france has arrived here although tall and of handsome presence he is but a boy only seventeen if your worship had seen him you would have said that he was only a stripling and not fit for such hard service but you would have changed your mind if you had seen how he attacked the moors on my faith i had always believed that from santiago down only the spaniards attacked the moors in that way we believe here that what he wanted to do was to perform another exploit like the one related by michael's mother of hernando del pulgar in her native granada and to fasten the ave maria on the tent of don manuel habas and that he would have done it too if he hadn't been held back and mind you father it is a very noble thing and one worthy of admiration to come without anything obliging him to do it to this war which is no child's play just for the sake of proving himself brave. True it is that to have that name is worth more than all the gold in the world, and lifts one a foot above the ground. We have made more than half a dozen charges with the bayonet, father, like the one in which your worship took part. These charges are not, as one might say, greatly to the taste of the Moors, who, when they hear the call to the charge, to which we have given the name 
general prim's polka tremble and turn pale and fall back note it may properly be related here that this same division with its leader general prim reconnoitring at a few leagues distance from tetuan came upon a poor old moorish woman sick and abandoned by her people and that putting her on a stretcher they carried her on their shoulders to tetuan with all the gentleness of sisters of charity note of the author End note. michael gives me many remembrances for you and bids me tell catherine that he does not forget her and he bids me tell you father that you were right when you said that his saint would not neglect the weather vane that has always pointed for spain for we have never once been defeated and mind you that the moors are valiant men and that they fight with desperate courage with this i say good-bye asking your blessing for your son gaspar mother i never enter action without commending myself to the virgin as you told me to do it will be easy to understand the delight of the parents on reading this cheering and animated letter which was read many times over for as soon as it was known in the village that a letter had arrived from africa the house was besieged with people eager to hear the news of the most national and popular war which spain has had since the independence chapter seven several days passed and the loving mother's heart was once more a prey to anxiety john joseph she said to her husband we have heard nothing and that means that they can't take tetuan hold your tongue you foolish woman answered her husband wherever the sun enters the spaniards can enter and don't you know that zamora wasn't taken in an hour and that the artillery can't cross over swamps and that a causeway has to be built women who know nothing about war think that to take a fortress in an enemy's country is as easy as to toss a pancake but on the fifth of february a muleteer who came from zerez brought the news to bornos which had been transmitted to zerex by telegraph that a hard-fought battle had taken place the preceding day before tetuan in which as in all the previous ones the spaniards had come off victorious having made themselves masters of five encampments of the enemy although at the cost of many lives his patriotic ardour added to a feeling of deep anxiety made it impossible for john joseph to remain in the village and he set out for xerez there he learned that the wounded of that memorable day were to be taken to seville and as a train of materials for the railroad was just leaving for that city he begged to be taken on board the seventh of february dawned a day memorable for ever in the annals of spain day had scarcely broken when the sonorous and soul-stirring bells of the cathedral of seville diffusing authorizing and solemnizing joy announced to the sleeping people the great and auspicious event of the taking of tetuan it would be impossible to give an idea of the impression caused by those sounds for who can describe the apogee of the most unanimous ardent and national enthusiasm but let a few facts speak for themselves the priests who repaired to the churches to say mass recited it solemnly in chorus and afterwards chanted the te deum that august hymn of thanks to the lord the venerable generals guajardo and hernandez military authorities of the district and both veterans in whose laurels there is not a leaf that time can wither when they met fell into each other's arms unable to utter a word the sight of this noble spectacle drawing tears from the eyes of the officers who were present when the alcalde presented himself before the archbishop to ask his consent to take in procession the image of the immaculate virgin the patroness of spain and the standard and sword of st ferdinand the venerable prince of the church burst into tears causing the alcalde to shed tears also seeing which a man of the people rushed to the latter saying senor alcal let me embrace your worship the people called for their venerable pastor and the latter showing himself on the balcony blessed his flock who cheered him enthusiastically the various sodalities of women entered their magnificent chapel in procession giving thanks aloud to the virgin musicians paraded the streets followed by a multitude intoxicated with joy who cheered the queen spain the army and the generals who had led it to victory and who stopped before the houses where the commanders and officers wounded in this glorious war were lodged to cheer them also 
in the public square a vendor of oranges abandoned his stall and his merchandise leaving behind him a notice which said the owner of this stall has turned crazy with joy and here he leaves this trash others broke the jars of a water seller the value of which they gave him promptly saying what is this water to-day nothing but wine is to be drunk in seville further on another group shouted no one sleeps to-night whoever sleeps to-night is an englishman flags on the towers hangings on the houses the pleasing noise of joy everywhere a telegraphic dispatch shouted the blind men beside themselves with joy announcing the entrance of our valiant troops into the great city of tetuan and the utter annihilation of the moors long live spain long live the queen long live the army long live the moors what is that you are saying man long live the moors yes so that we may kill them again such is the enthusiasm of the spanish people when it is unanimous legitimate and genuine they go to their churches take out in procession the immaculate virgin cheer their queen their prelates their authorities their country applaud their army which gives them power and greatness its commander and the generals who lead it and those who bring back from the war glorious wounds and not even for its most ferocious enemies does it find the odious death and that you brave soldiers who remain in africa who have bestowed so great a joy upon your country should be unable to witness the gratitude with which it repays you perhaps the universal and frantic enthusiasm inspired by the taking of a moorish city however heroic the exploit which had put it in the power of the spaniards may seem disproportioned to the occasion but this is not the case for in the first place the people with their admirable instinct know that the result is in everything what gives it its value they feel besides that it is not only a moorish city and the advantages its capture may bring which its army has gained for spain but also that from the moorish fire the spanish phoenix has arisen directing its flight to a glorious future and in the second place because in these public demonstrations in this ardent expansion the country gives expression to three months of admiration of interest and of sympathy this was owed to the army for its constancy for its unequalled valour for its boundless humanity this debt the country owed and it paid it in love in admiration and enthusiasm on the eighth the same rejoicings were continued processions salvos and so much firing of guns everywhere that it was said as much powder was expended in it as in the taking of tetuan on the ninth one of the principal streets of the city was named the street of tetuan the ceremony taking place at eight o'clock in the evening when the municipal council went in procession to the street carrying the queen's likeness in the meantime maria had had no news of john joseph exaggerated reports of the losses by which the victory had been gained were spread maria was unable to control her anxiety and she set out as many other mothers of the peasantry did for the capital where the wounded who might perhaps be able to give her some news of her sons were to be brought mother and daughter reached seville on the evening of the ninth and after resting for a few moments at an inn went out to inquire where the wounded who had been recently brought to the city had been taken a vast crowd of people and enthusiastic cheering announced to them the approach of the procession they stood on a bench in a porch to watch it as it passed five mounted pioneers and a numerous band headed the procession the municipal guard followed on foot then came four men carrying flags followed by a number of men bearing torches and then the soldiers who had been wounded in africa wearing laurel wreaths and carrying ensigns with the names in silver letters of the principal victories gained by the army after these came the municipal council headed by the civil governor and two councillors carrying the likeness of the queen and the procession was closed by a detachment of infantry with another band of music at its head here come the wounded soldiers cried the crowd and the cheering became more enthusiastic and tears ran down the cheeks of the women as they stopped to look admiringly at the wounded heroes and then joined the procession look at that one look at that poor fellow he isn't able to walk alone they are supporting him said someone close beside maria pointing to a young man who with his arm in a sling his pale forehead crowned with laurel and carrying in his hand 
an ensign bearing on it the word tetuan walked with a modest expression on his thin but pleasing face leaning on the arm of a robust old man whose proud and enraptured expression seemed to say to every one this brave man is my son maria whose heart had for many days past been agitated alternately by fear hope enthusiasm and anguish uttered a cry drawn from her by all these mingled feelings as she recognized in the emaciated and glory-covered wounded soldier her son and fell into catherine's arms chapter eight a few months later a happy wedding the wedding of catherine and michael was celebrated in bornos gaspar whose health was entirely re-established but who had lost his right arm was present but if he had lost an arm he had in return received a gold medal a cross with a pension attached to it and an annuity the last as having been disabled in the war in africa the cross for bravery and the medal for humane and gallant conduct every day is a day of thanksgiving there is not a happier father in the world than i exclaimed john joseph gaily my only grief is to see you crippled my boy but that can't be helped you have paid your debt to the country like an honest man gaspar and the country father answered gaspar pointing proudly to his cross and medal has acquitted herself fully of hers to me you are right my son and so sirs a toast long live the queen and long live all the generous and patriotic spaniards who like her majesty and the royal family have aided in taking care of the wounded and disabled soldiers of the african war End of chapter 8 End of Stories by Foreign Authors Spanish Authors